Hello again everyone, and in typical fashion, sorry we've been away, it's been a long, long while, but here we are, and I have a review of the new Godzilla King of the Monsters movie for you, okay, uh, spoilers, okay, I can't talk about this without getting into spoilers, alright, so deal with it, if you haven't seen it by now, it's been a week, come on guys, what are you doing, in a word, insanity, just absolute insanity, it feels like Michael Daughtry simply went into a kaiju movie buffet and just kept taking scoops of different elements from all of his favorite movies and then he tried to eat it all in one sitting. There were too many human characters and not enough for all of them to do. That's why it kind of felt overly stuffed. Uh, the movie has very, very little breathing room and to me, uh, certain things just kind of felt very overstuffed or, or kind of rushed, I hate to say. You know, we have Thomas Middleditch and then the white guy from Get Out, and they're kind of both the comedic relief. Like, why do we need two comedic reliefs? And then the character that uh, Ice Cube's son plays, he didn't really have that much to do either. I thought he was going to be this cool badass who showed up and, you know, tried to 1v1 King Ghidorah, and he was only in a couple scenes and didn't really have that much to do. So, to get into the plot, we have the main MacGuffin of the story, which is this device called the Orca which I guess is supposed to be an obvious reference to the boat in Jaws, I suppose. It can control the monsters like a big dog whistle, which they kind of flirted with at the end of Godzilla 1984. But why did you want to do that? Why do you want to control the monsters for? I mean, they'll never find my frequency though. No mind controlled over here. Mm -mm. I did like Millie Bobby Brown's character. Uh, her name was Madison in this movie. I liked that we have the child perspective again. I think that was kind of missing from not just my own movie, but from the Gareth Edwards film. Uh, I can't honestly remember the last time I saw a, a child in danger in a large giant monster movie, especially not an American one. I mean, let me think, in King Kong, no. Cloverfield, no. Uh, geez, no. So it's good to have that kid perspective again. Kids in danger, it adds to the stakes, it adds to the conflict, it's good. I totally think they wasted the Oxygen Destroyer. Okay, so the Oxygen Destroyer, uh, the, the, the army general, he just kind of comes out of nowhere on a screen and says, Oh, by the way, we have this thing, and it can kill both of these monsters. Well, why did they waste it? The Oxygen Destroyer is like an endgame level Godzilla MacGuffin, and they just whip it out and use it within like two minutes, and then it disappears from the movie entirely. Completely a waste of time. I would have preferred that for them to save that for a later time when it could have been better developed and better utilized instead of just a cheap throwaway thing to get Godzilla to to kind of die and then retreat to the lost city of Atlantis. Which, by the way, how cool is that though, that Godzilla just lives in Atlantis? I'm gonna go knock on his door and see if I can come over and visit and have a couple brewskis with him. Dude, can we uh, bring the brewskis? Yes, of course, you may absolutely bring the brewskis. Yeah! I hate the annoying crosshairs thing. So we have Vera Farmiga's character, Emma. She's, first of all, she's telling the good guys her evil plan, you know, whatever. But you got that big annoying thing right through her face, that line in the middle of the screen. Why did they need to do that? I get that the secret base has to have monitors and be all technologically advanced and everything, but just make one big screen! Don't make it four little screens all put together like that, and then you got this big ugly line across her face. It's stupid! Burning Godzilla kind of seemed tacked on there as well. Like they needed another ticking clock in the climax to, to you know, up the stakes again. Although it was awesome to see live-action burning Godzilla again. There's too many people counting down in this movie too, like we get it, okay, you got a million ticking clocks and that, uh, we're counting this down, oh no, we're counting down until Ghidorah gets to Boston or whatever the hell they were going. Okay, who are all these unknown, unnamed kaiju at the end of the movie? Like, we had Manny from Ice Age and the female Muto again, like, why not take a chance to bring in Anguirus or another classic kaiju and put them in that scene as a little, you know, nod or easter egg to the fans? That ending scene where Godzilla's like king and everything and they're all standing around him and it looks like the cover of a 70s rock album, it kind of felt like a beat from one of the Bay Era Transformers movies, where we have a mix of slightly familiar Autobot and Decepticon designs, and then there's just completely new ones in there and it's mixed in and it just kind of feels hollow in a way. I will say this though, King Ghidorah in this movie was awesome. 
totally nailed it. Loved everything about King Ghidorah. I love that the left head was kind of like the whipping boy of the group, that the other two heads just kind of picked on him the whole movie. And Middlehead hated left head. I, I don't know what he did. Why even bother including Tywin Lannister in this movie, you know? He didn't really seem like he had that much to do, and he just comes in out of nowhere right after Mothra has that whole thing, and they get that under control, and then, oh, no, sh boom, oh, sh here comes Tywin Lannister. He's gonna red wedding everybody. Uh, just make Emma the main villain and have that be a big twist in the middle of the movie. Like, Madison could have been like, oh, shit, mom's the bad guy, but no, we really have to have these clearly defined bad guys, blah, blah, blah. See, too many human characters. The music was great. The classic themes blaring through the IMAX speakers. Oh, that sounded so good. And they finally listened to my advice. They put a cover of the Blue Oyster Cult song in this movie. Thank God. Feels so good to hear that. So many missed opportunities in the past to include that song, but at least they finally did it. This is a minor gripe, but I think the end credits try to jam too much in there too. Like you got the names coming up, and then you got all these, you know, news headlines about Skull Island, and they're trying to set up... Godzilla vs. Kong, and it's just too much to read all at once. It's like, space that shit out, you know? Stop jamming the screen with information. Honestly, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think the Edwards movie is better paced. Uh, but there's an imbalance. The Edwards film has too little of everything and too much breathing room, whereas this one is too stuffed and feels bursting at the seams. These movies have always been schlock at their best. Sometimes they're gourmet schlock, where maybe we learn about the environment and not to screw with nature and blah 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 and all that. But this one triples down on those types of themes and executes them kind of like a 70s Godzilla movie would. But with the tone of a 90s Godzilla movie. So that's either a good or a bad thing, take it as you will. I will say this though, this movie is kaiju fan heaven. Just the amount of action, giant monsters, it's just giant monsters, it's just big monsters. I do find it interesting that this movie and the HBO series Chernobyl have kind of come out at the same time. Both of them deal with radiation and all that kind of, you know, nuclear fallout kind of stuff, but in two totally different ways. Obviously Godzilla being science fiction and the HBO series is very true to life. I highly recommend that show if, you know, if you're a mature audience and you want to learn about history, but it's just so good and it really helps you understand a lot about radiation. Because it's kind of, you know, just a science fiction thing that we don't really understand. I kind of never quite kind of understood that. But the HBO show kind of puts it into perspective and helps you understand really what radiation is. Which, in turn, kind of helps you understand the real fear about Godzilla in the first place that the Japanese had when they made the first movie. In conclusion, I'm left with the fact that the best American Godzilla movie is still my own. I know this comes as a shock to everyone, but sometimes the truth stings like a Ghidorah gravity beam.